Let's turn to Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. Uh, tonight, today is going to be a very fun study, very interesting study. I'm going to challenge you to the max. But it talks about really the steps to real revival. And I believe there are certain things that you can pray about, look at, and even begin to kind of jot down and hang on. If you uh, would rather get the CD, you can get the CD. But steps to a real revival, Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. Uh, let me read that to you, just to kind of get the feel for what's happening. And in these five verses, there are a lot of names, and you're never going to remember them, so I'm going to skip over that. But now in the 24th day of this month, on this month, the children of Israel were assembled with the fasting and with sackcloth and earth upon them. So they would put earth upon their head. They would change and put sackcloth, which is like, you know, really, really, really coarse. It'd be like taking a potato bag and wearing a potato bag. And then, you know, they were fasting. And so they were denying their flesh, and they were seeking to get right with God. David did this when he was in trouble. He walked out, put dust upon his head, took his sandals off, walked out barefooted when he left his kingdom. But it goes on to declare, Israel, they're going to get together. And what I find interesting is no one's telling them to do this. They did this on their own. They assembled with fasting and with sackcloth and earth upon them. The seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. So God is moving. They're now confessing. They're standing. They're very tuned in to what they're doing. And they're also acknowledging in the past their fathers were not perfect. There was iniquity in their heart. They stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day and another fourth part they confessed. So three hours they confessed and then for another three hours they worshiped, which is interesting. You're going to have to confess and then you're going to be able to worship. And then he says in verse 4, then stood up upon the stairs of the Levites and it says here, and they cried with a loud voice unto the Lord their God. Then the Levites said, Stand up, bless the Lord your God forever and ever, and blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessings and praise. So what is happening here is unbelievable because, because of what happened in chapter 8. Everything happens in chapter 9. And that's what I really want to teach you. If you do it right, there's going to be evidence. And when you do what they did in chapter 8, something is going to have to give. And I want to encourage you, Satan is going to have to go and God is going to bless your life. So what happened in chapter 8? Well, let me give you kind of a, uh, what we talked about. We mentioned eight things happened in chapter 8 last week. And it talks about really what are the steps to real revival. And we, we saw eight things were recorded. Now you can find more. These are the, what the eight I found. In verse 1, I must wait upon the Lord. So if I was going to say, what would help us maybe to see the power of a revival or God to change the church? I think there are probably eight things you could jot down. Number one, you have to be patient. You have to wait. And the reason why is God's timing is not your timing. We get ahead of God very often. We do. We get, it's premature. When sometimes we think we're doing exactly what God wants us to do, God doesn't really want us to do it. For instance, Moses took out and killed one man. Well, God wanted to bury the whole army. Well, Moses was premature, and it cost him 40 years of his life. Sometimes you get premature in marriage, and you marry the person, and it's not God's best. And though you can redeem it, and you can do things to make it right, it's still pretty hard. But if you are patient, then the Bible says things are going to happen in a wonderful way. And that's what we talked about in chapter 8. They came back, you remember the phrase? They came back a second day. So the first day, they were speaking, and Ezra was reading the Word. And then they came back a second day. And what happened the second day is that's when God revealed the Word to them, and God blessed them in a very powerful way. And so number one, are you willing to wait? Are you willing to be patient? Are you willing to let God work in each of your lives? If you are not patient, you're going to hurt the children. You're going to hurt yourself. You're going to hurt other people because your ways are not God's ways. And God has a timing completely different. So you have to be patient. 
Number two, you have to have the book. You have to bring the book. You remember in verse 2 of chapter 8, Ezra, bring the book. I think every church to stand up and say, Pastor, bring the book. Maze, where's the book? We're not talking about, you know, National Geographic. Bring me the Bible. I want to hear the Bible. And if churches would stand up and tell their pastors, we don't want to hear another story, bring the book. God would change that church and just turn it upside down. And that's what's happened with the nations. We don't have the Bible as a book any longer. And so here, they're crying out for the book. Why? If you have the book, God's going to change your life. This book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. Third, you have to give attention to. Notice it says in verse 3, they gave attention. They were quiet, they were sensitive, and they paid attention. They were listening for God to speak. So they were there standing not six hours, listening faithfully to what God was doing. That's a long time. And all of a sudden, you begin to realize that's a whole bunch of time to be. So if you have ADD, that's not a good thing. My, sometimes people say, well, you have ADD. Well, I probably do. My dog definitely has ADD. He's all over the place. And sometimes I have to take him and take him by the snout and say, Chewy, look at me. Look at me. Pay attention. And then I come home and my wife grabs me by the snout and says, pay attention. <laughs> listen to me, Steve. <laughs> you know, because I don't. I'm all over the place. It's hard to listen. But yet, if you can listen, that's half the battle. If a husband could listen, the wife wouldn't be telling him ten times. Take out the trash. Do you take out the trash? Are you going to take out the trash? When are you going to take out the trash? So ten different ways because you don't take out the trash. So if you could take out the trash and listen to her, you probably get away two, three times. Much easier. <laughs> but if not, ten times at least. So listen, is, it helps. Number th four, I must search his word. So it talks about in verse 14, they search. And what I, why do I say that? They came back a second time, and when they were in God's word, they read about the tabernacle, and they read about the booths. So now they begin to search and find out exactly what they had to do. So the Bible told them, go out and get the branches, go get this, go get that, and you bring the children, make it part of your family, and have the whole family live in this booth for seven days. And so all of a sudden, they were digging. And you have to have a heart. And that's the question. Do you have a heart to search? Are you really tuned in? Do you really want to know Jesus Christ? Do you really want to be like Christ? Do you really want to have a heart like God? These are important questions in these days because there's lawlessness going on. And if you don't have a hunger for God, if you don't really have a craving for the things of God, then you're going to miss it, and it's going to break your heart. So you really have to have a hunger. And then, number five, I have to share the Word. You remember what happened? They, in chapter 8, God was moving, and all of a sudden He said, listen, this is the day of the Lord. Be happy. Go tell people who could not make it what God is doing. So because of God working in my heart, and because I'm now listening, and because I'm now searching, and because God is speaking, now tell the people what God's doing in your life. And that's what I'm doing today. I'm telling you how great God is and what God wants to do. And then, number six, I must obey His Word. So it's one thing to talk about it, but then I have to build the booth. Then I have to live in it. Now, sometimes it's easier to live in your house and build the booth. But God wants you in that booth. No air condition, no windows. It's cold. It's freezing. But here is what I believe. It's better to be cold and have nothing and be outside with all your kids in God's will than to be inside a warm house out of God's will. So you have to make a decision. How important is God's will in your life? To me, it's everything. Because you know what it's like when you're out of God's will. And then number seven. Number seven, they celebrate it. You remember what it says in chapter 8? They celebrate. They begin to have joy. They start laughing. What do I mean? I imagine dad just couldn't do it. Dad tried to build it. It fell down. Mom probably built the tent. And all of a sudden, they're in there, and the kids are hungry, and there's nothing. There's no cooking. Mom wants this. Mom wants that. And the kids just start laughing. Everyone's cracking up. And there's something about having just a bunch of branches and living there and having a family than being inside a house and being warm with no family around. Everyone's in their own room. So now you're huddled, and you're talking about things you've never talked about before. And lastly, we mentioned in verse 18 that they had a daily desire to be in God's Word. Every day, Ezra was teaching every single day for seven days. It was the Feast of Tabernacles. So every day you had a Bible study. They had a hunger. 
And so they came daily. And so my devotional life. So here's how I look at this. Number one, Steve Mays. Am I willing to wait on God's perfect will? Am I willing to put the book before my life? Am I willing to give attention to the things that God is speaking to? Am I willing to search diligently and go deep into God's Word? Am I willing to share the things that God has taught me? Am I willing to be obedient and not be a hypocrite with His Word? Am I willing to let God put the joy in my heart? And lastly, am I willing to do this for the rest of my life, day in and day out? And the answer is yes. I believe if that's my attitude, God can start something new. So when I speak about a revival, that's what I'm talking about, a rediscovery. So in chapter 8, we see them standing before this incredible moment of, of Ezra. And look at chapter 8, verse 8. So they read in the book in the law of God distinctively and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. This is so important. If you stand before the Word of God, God is going to give you understanding. So here are three reasons why I just cannot encourage you enough why you need to be in the Bible. If you're reading the Bible, three things are going to happen. Number one, you're going to understand. God is going to help you understand the thing you're going through. The Bible says concerning Issachar, they were able to understand the times and seasons. They were able to not get whacked out. They could understand that there's a time, there's a season, there's a moment, there's not a moment. In other words, things work themselves out, and that's what he's saying here. They gave sense. God will bring sense, and God will cause you to understand. You say, well, I don't think that has ever happened. Well, if you set before God with this Bible, and you sat there, and you try to study it, and you ask the Holy Spirit to help you, I guarantee you, He is going to do it. He's going to help you do that. Number two, what's going to happen is found in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. It says, notice the very last verse, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Joy is going to fill your heart. And everything you do, in deed or word, you do for the glory of God. You do it with joy. And God will give you the joy, and there's a strength in joy. You begin to do it with absolute strength. Because why? You are before the book. You take the book out, there's no joy. You take the book out, and there's no understanding. You put the book in somebody's life, they will understand it, and the joy of the Lord will be their strength. And then we read in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 17, it says in the very last verse, there was very great gladness. In other words, there was gladness. Not only was there joy, but there was absolute gladness. Everyone was thrilled to death that they found the Word and the revival broke out. And that's exactly what happened. So the Word here to revive or to really to restore is an interesting word. It means to recover. Now listen very carefully. To recover or return from a state of neglect. So let me put it down. Are you neglecting God's Word? Are you kind of doing it, kind of not doing it? Would you say that you're consistent daily in the reading of God's Word? So if I go a week without it, is that okay? Not at all. In other words, if you go a week without eating, how are you doing? <laughs> not very well. You need food. You need food of your spirit. So you're feeding your flesh, but you're starving your spirit. And so you're going to have problems. Your body appetites are going to take over, and that's what he's saying. So it means to recover or return from a state of neglect. You remember the man in the Bible? All of a sudden, Joseph said, do you have a place that we can stay, Mary and Joseph? And the man said, what? I'm sorry, we have no room in the end. What a horrible thing. Was he not loving God? No, I can't say that. Why did he do it? Because he was busy. He was simply not used in his head. He neglected the most important thing. He could have helped that person, and his name would have gone down in history. Now it's down in history as the man who was too busy. So he simply neglected, but that neglect cost him really a precious price. He could have had Jesus born in his house. That would be the difference between life and death. So when I talk to you about are you neglecting, what I'm really saying to you is are you neglecting what God wants to do in your life? Because he can't do it. He can't get rid of the bitterness. He can't make you victorious. He has a difficult time if you're unwilling to bring your life into where God works. And the Bible always works with the Holy Spirit. So what is the instrument the Holy Spirit uses? The Word of God. So if I keep the Bible out, 
he can't work. So here, it means to awaken, or it means to be on a spiritual alert. And what is happening in the United States? We've missed it. There's no revival going on anywhere. And so we need that so desperately. So chapter 8, kind of cool, think about it. They're standing before the Word. And chapter 9, they are falling down before the Word because of the power of the conviction. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 8, there is gladness fills their heart. In chapter 9, the sadness of their sin is now manifested, and they are crying and weeping before God. In chapter 8, they are no longer, they are feasting and having a great time eating their hearts out, like pizza and everything else. I'm hungry right now. But in chapter 9, they're fasting before God because they're scared to death. They don't know what's going on. And chapter 8, no longer are they dancing before the Lord. Now they're falling down in the dust crying out. What happened between chapter 8 and chapter 9? Very simply, they got the book. And when you have the book, that's what's going to happen. So you're going to be home doing dishes, and all of a sudden, God is going to speak. And He's going to speak like He's never spoke before. And you're going to back up, you're going to look around, and you're going to have to think about it. Because God is speaking, and God wants your attention. And if you're going to give Him attention, if you're going to listen to what He has to say, it's going to change your life. He's going to give you understanding. He's going to show you what is wrong in your marriage or how to fix it or how to understand or how to be patient. He's going to show you. That's the great thing. I was born in a revival in 1970, and all of a sudden when God saved me, even to this day, believe it or not, I can still sense the fire holding my heart. There's a warmth in my heart that God has grabbed. It's never left. And if you've been saved in revival, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like there's something different. God gets a hold. So yes, I want it back. Because I don't believe you can change people. I don't believe pastors can change people. I think now, because of the lawlessness out there, it's going to take a pure work of the Holy Spirit to get in and to change your hearts. Because we're so hurt and so bitter, it's going to take God to do it. And that's fine. But I just want you to know, I think, where we are. And so when you stand before God... Things are going to happen. So remember, they stood for three hours before the Word. What happened? God began to convict them. Then what happened? Well, when they begin to confess, when they begin to talk about how bad they really are, all of a sudden, they finally were empty. They got it all out. And guess what happened? They begin to worship. And when all of a sudden, I'm absolutely confessing to God, not to man, but I'm pouring my heart out to God, when I'm done... There's only one thing left to do, lift my hands and worship God and begin to celebrate because now I know that I'm right before God. And isn't that what it's about? It's about me being right with God. So we come to this incredible moment in our life. Let me give you five things to think about, five interesting things. Number one, verse one, a life of humility. So why did I say that? Because, you remember what I said? Are you willing to return? Are you willing to come back? Are you willing to give God another chance? They came back the second day. Are you willing to come back the third day? Are you hungry? Are you desperate? Do you have to have it? Otherwise, you're going to die. If the answer is yes, that is a great place to be in your life because that means you're going to go after God's Word. And when you start going after God's Word, God is going to get a hold of your heart. So now we find that because of your humility, yes, I'm willing what made you neglect it? I don't know. What made you walk away from the Word of God? I don't know. Why is TV more important than the Word? I don't know. But do you realize what I'm saying? Yes. Are you willing to get back? Yes. There's an interesting story in the Old Testament. If Elijah, I've told you before, a guy was hacking away working, and all of a sudden he's chopping down this tree, and his axe handle, axe ha iron, came off the end of the wood and flew into the river. And so he comes back to Elijah. I love the story. He says, alas, master, alas, I can't work no more. <laughs> Elijah said, what are you talking about? Well, I don't have nothing to cut down trees. Look, wood. I think the guy really had one up on Elijah. And what did Elijah say? Where did you lose it? And the guy took him. He said, I lost it right here. I lost it right here. No, no, no. right here. I lost it right here. Okay. So Elijah prays, and the Bible says, and it swam to shore. The iron. Oh, pastor. You don't believe it swam to shore. I do. Because that's what it says. So I can't believe the whole thing. 
If it says, if you believe in the very beginning, in the beginning was God, you got to believe it all. Amen? So it says it swam to shore. He picked it up, put it on the axe head, and gave it back to him. He said, now get back to work. And that's a great story, wouldn't you say? But here's, the, here's a better story. Same story. All of a sudden, you come to me and you say, I'm having a terrible day. I just don't feel like I want to walk with God anymore. I'm ready to leave my wife, whatever it might be. I'm ready just to call it quits. I can't handle it no more. Well, what happened? I don't know. What's going on in your life? I don't know. I get that all the time. And so this is what I say. Hey, um, can I ask a question? Yeah. Where did you lose it? Well, what do you mean, Pastor? Where did you lose it? Where did, when did you commit the sin? What did you do? Did you commit adultery? Did you, well, about three months ago I started drinking. Well, so what bar were you at? Oh, I was at the thing down the street. Gentleman owned. Oh, so you, you, you got pornography going, you got drinking going. So he could tell me where he lost it. Remember the guy? Show me where you lost it. That to me is the greatest miracle of all because you can't tell me you don't know. And people do it all the time. They say, well, I just don't know. They're lying to you. You see, they're not willing to be humble. They're not willing to be honest. If you're not going to be honest, it's not going to work. If you're not going to be humble, it's not going to work. Revival will never come your way. God can pour it out. God can do a great work. But if you are going to hold back, if you're going to say, I don't know, I don't understand, you know, it's just come and go, that's not true. Every one of us knows exactly what happened. When we got out of the Word, when we stopped fellowship, when we copped an attitude with God, what God did that we were so mad at God, what happened? Or who passed us over? Why we hate the church so much? You know exactly what's happening. And that is a wonderful thing. So number one, now in the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting, with sackcloth, and with, ash, with, with earth on their head. They knew exactly what they wanted to do. They wanted to get right. They needed to get right. Number two, number two, a life not only of humility. I, I want to reconnect. And by the way, you got those cell phones. They always disconnect. Amen? And you're always dropping lines. That's what I'm talking about. Now, that's a Verizon, whatever it might be. You drop a line. That's what it means. Now, we understand that because we want to connect. Or you get in your car, you got Bluetooth. What happens when you can't use it? You have to go back in. You have to connect it. You have to tie the two together. You understand all that. That's what I'm talking about. Your Bluetooth in your spirit is off. So if it's off, where is it on? See, it has to be off or on. Amen? So if it's off here... Where is it on? Oh, is that important? Yeah. Oh, it's right down the street, pornography. It's, it's on there. <laughs> oh, my wife's always told me when a woman leaves, she always has some guy to go to. She taught me well. And so the very same thing. You just don't go from here to here. You always are planning. So here, number two, a life of separation. Check it out. It says the seed of Israel separated themselves on their own. They did it. They understood Hey, we need to get with it. We should have never been mixed marriages. We should have never been unequally yoked. There are many people who are unequally yoked right now. And so you won't let it go because you just don't want to lose it. You, you don't want to be empty. You don't want to lose it. Well, I'll tell you what, if you don't do it, you're never going to be fulfilled inside. Either get married or get out. But you can't be sinning against God. So if you're living with somebody and you have children, let's get you married. And let's do <laughs> What? A commitment? <laughs> yes, a commitment. You had those kids. Let's get a commitment. Well, I just don't want to make a commitment. <laughs> okay. You know what I'm talking about. So you don't want to be honest. So see, you're, we're, because America plays games, there's no revival. When a people all of a sudden say, you know, Steve, Maybe America doesn't want it, but I want it. I need it. I have to have it. And then you're going to hear what I have to say. Number one, I have to humble myself. Number two, I have to separate myself. I have to understand what he's saying here and what he's done. I separate from all strangers. Unequally yoked cannot happen. I give my heart. I give my soul. I give my love to God. I give my heart to the Spirit, and I give my heart to everything that God wants in my life. I cannot share my love with God. God is a jealous God. He will not do it. We have these new pups because the one died. Remember, I bought the two pups. Well, Chewy, if I go to pick up a pup, Chewy is all over me, knocking that pup out. Why? 
Because he's mad at me? No, because he wants my full attention. And so that's exactly what he wants. He's jealous. He has a jealous love for me. God has a jealous love for you. And then notice here, Israel separated themselves from all strangers. In verse 2, check it out. And stood and confessed their sins and their iniquity of their fathers. So not only are they standing before God, but now God begins to get them. And guess what? The first thing that comes up, they are confessing. Well, Steve, uh, I don't have anything to say. Say, oh, really? You, you've been away from God, but you have nothing to say, huh? If you're unwilling to be honest, it's not going to work. So, yes, they confessed. And not only did they confess their sins, but they confessed the iniquity of their fathers, the inward twisting and how their fathers lied and got them into all this mess. And that's a wonderful thing. When you start getting honest and you start separating from evil, that's a wonderful thing. Number three. A life of confession, verse 3, they stood up, and we have sinned. Yes, we have. They stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord, their God, one fourth part of the day, three hours, another fourth part of the confess, and then they worshiped. So one section was three hours long, and all they did was confess. And then the next three hours, all they did was worship. Here's what I want to point out. You have to confess before worship is possible. You're never going to be able to worship with depth until the heart is pure. So you need to get out the junk, and you need to put in righteousness and goodness and the purity of the Holy Spirit. And so here, we need to feed the inner man. And so when I'm standing before God and pouring out my heart and saying, God, I did this, and God, I haven't been a good husband, and Lord, you know, I haven't been really good with the kids, and I haven't been good in my Bible studies, and I haven't been good with... You know, there's a lot of things I can confess of. But God, you've got to change me. And all of a sudden, you're going to find out the bitterness you have, the resentment you have. And it just comes out. And when you are done, and I'm not talking about man. I'm talking about you and God. When that thing finally comes out and you're empty, because you have been honest for the first time in your life about your sin, you have nothing else, guess what? Worship begins to fill your soul like a brand new pool. And all of a sudden, you are full, and the first thing that happens is you begin to worship God because you have never felt so pure and so holy before. And there's a great thing about being pure and holy. There's a great feeling about being righteous and not being a hypocrite. There's a wonderful thing about telling the truth and not lying because you don't have to look over your shoulders. And that's what God wants in His people. He wants His people on fire, but He doesn't want them in hypocrisy. He doesn't want them to send the kids to bed so they can watch the R-rated movies. If you can't let the kids watch it, then you, don't wa you watch it. So throw it away. In other words, you should be able to say, son, you can watch whatever I watch. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's not true. I don't know. But I tell you what, they know you're watching R-rated movies. Amen? They know it. Don't kid yourself. Because mom's praying, oh, God, help dad not watch those R-rated movies. <laughs> And then, check it out, in verse 3 again, they read the book. This is so cool. They stood up in their place and read the book. Now, I want to show you something kind of neat. Number one, they stood before the book, and guess what? Tell me. They confessed. Amen? They stood before the book, and they worshiped. And lastly, they stood before the book, and they ministered. Everything is wrapped around this book. If I hold on to it, it's going to change my life if I read it. This book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. So we read here a life of worship, and then a life of giving. In verses 3 through 5, they stood up in their place and read the book of the law of the Lord their God. One fourth part of the day, another fourth part they confessed and worshiped their God. Now check out verse 4 and 5. Then stood up upon the stairs of the Levites, cried with a loud voice unto the Lord their God. Then the Levites stand up, and they bless the Lord your God forever and ever. And blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praises. So guess what? When you are right with God, everything's going to happen. But it's about this book. I can't get away from it. If I say to you, what do you need? It's the book. What is the thing that's changed my life? The book. What's the thing that got me through the sickness? The book. This book has changed my life because it is 
full of miraculous miracles and powers in your life. It's hard, yes. But when I open it up, I'm convicted because it points out what I'm doing wrong. When I open this book, it drains me and fills me with the most incredible quickness of the Holy Spirit. And so now I'm worshiping God. But also, let me tell you, when I have this book, something happens. I now have a ministry. And I'm full of the Spirit of God. And now I can be a blessing. And now I can give and give and give and give. And that's what they're talking about right here in verse 4 and 5. They're giving. They're sharing. They're ministering. What happened? Just a little bit before, they were what? Disconnected. They were not tuned in. They were estranged, afar off. They weren't really doing much of anything. Then someone pulled them in and they got connected. The moment they got connected, everything turned around. They saw the book. They begin to confess. They begin to worship. And they have never felt this way before. And they went out of the presence of God ministering the love of Jesus Christ. Now tell me, that is the cry of America. But the question comes is, will we respond? I don't know. What do I need to do? Well, I'm not real sure, but I know this. It starts on your knees. And it has to get to your heart. And it has to change your mind. And you have to somehow give your life and your soul and your being to the one who made you with joy in your heart and trust him with all your heart because he will never hurt you. The one who's hurting you the most is yourself because you think that you know more than God and you don't. Take the book 